фестивале сегодня выступит бывший директор программы «Едом человека», доктор Чарльз Кантер. Доктор Чарльз Кантер также является полным профессором университета Бостона и полным профессором университета Калифорнии. Также он является сооснователем компании «Сикино», компания, которая является лидером по неинвазивной перинатальной диагностике и неинвазивной диагностике рака. А также один из лидеров на рынке масс-спектрометрии для генетического анализа. Он также основал множество других компаний, включая компанию «Ретродоп», которая использует ретродопно укрепленные органические соединения для борьбы с различными водорозависимыми заболеваниями и старением и многие другие компании. Приветствуем доктора Кантера. Доктор Кантер. So good afternoon. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is trying to use DNA uh, obtained from patients uh, to make medically useful decisions about patient care. And what that should evoke for most people is measuring a person's genome sequence. And then trying to make predictions based on that sequence. And that's not actually what I'm going to talk about. I'm not going to talk about that today. Because honestly, that doesn't work for the body, as I'll try to show you before. Because when we measure a person's genome sequence, we're measuring germline. And it turns out that germline here for simple data has very useful predictive data, but for complex data, it doesn't. I'm really going to be talking about using somatic data in example that may be different in different tissues uh, to make, make clinically useful decisions. And you'll see that um, We've made a lot of progress in the past few years in being able to take DNA not invasively from a patient, mostly from blood, sometimes from urine, and draw influences about those patients that today are being used to identify. So an outline of the talk is I'll show you some of the thinking about going on to try to convince you why it doesn't work. And then uh, I'll show you examples of using uh, somatic data uh, in two applications, prenatal diagnosis and cancer diagnosis. Okay? So we know already the uh, genome sequence of lots of people. And uh, more and more people are being sequenced every year. And uh, so it's fair to ask, in the last 10 years, uh, since we've had human genome sequence, uh, has it made a major impact on medicine? And by medicine, I mean not medical research, but actual clinical practice of medicine. And the answer by and large is no hasn't changed anything. Hasn't been useful. There are exceptions. In several of them, uh, in PL testing, in cancer, in certain eye diseases. But those are the exceptions. And in most, uh, for most major diseases, uh, knowing a person's genome sequence just doesn't particularly help. Now, The cost of DNA sequencing is getting cheaper and cheaper, and the accessibility of DNA sequencing is getting widespread. So what I'm trying to tell you is there's a mismatch between our ability to generate this information and our ability to use this information. And uh, here's an example. 
uh, the first genome-wide test that became widely available was a test from a company in the U.S. called 23 and which doesn't measure the whole genome sequence, but samples the genome at you know, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of sites. And the first person I know that was analyzed uh, by 23andMe is Mark Chi, who was one of the senior scientists at Illumina, one of the sequencing companies. And the only thing he learned from this test was that he was Asian. Of course, he knew that. And when I speak to other people I know who have been tested, even as recently as a few months ago, it has to change. Most of this information is not useful. Now, in the field of DNA sequencing, we're progressing from relatively simple tests like 23andMe to whole exome sequencing, all the genes, to whole genome sequencing, and the 6 billion base pairs of DNA. And, uh, so it's fair to ask, as we get more sequence information, is the situation going to improve? And I predict, by and large, that it will not improve. If you're interested in your genealogy, you'll learn a lot. No question about it. Uh, but if you're interested in your risk of common disease, as I'll try to show you, you're not going to learn it. Now, if you're interested in whether or not you have a rare disease and you know your genome sequence, it's tiny. <laughs> rare diseases, single gene diseases, what we call Mendelian diseases, are absolutely predictable from the DNA sequence. But if you have one of those rare diseases, you don't need to know your DNA sequence to know that you have one of these diseases like sickle cell I mean, you know it already. Right? So the problem is that it's hard to predict disease susceptibility from genome sequence. And the reason that we're talking germline DNA sequence, the sequence you inherited from your parents, the reason is that most common diseases are truly complex and they mix genetic effects that are horrendously complex and environmental effects. Now, humans are genetically very heterogeneous. If I had the DNA sequences of all of you in the room, any two people would just would just would, would have differences, millions of differences in their genome. And you, you can't solve a problem with a million inputs. So so uh, as we look back over the ten years where we've had genome sequences, only one complex disease has basically been solved. And that's something called age-related macular degeneration, AMH, which is the most common form of uh, blindness in, uh, I think, okay, okay, we're the most, and now I better not leave my hand. Uh, age-related macular degeneration is the most common form of blindness in old people. Uh, in 10% uh, uh, of the population, develops uh, uh, symptoms called dry AMD, and that's harmless. It's fatty deposits under the retina. You can see them in the eye, but it doesn't hurt you. Ten percent of those people, or one percent of the whole population, uh, the fatty deposits lead to inflammation that produces the growth of blood vessels in the eye, and these blood vessels eventually block uh, the central focus of the eye, and you go irreversibly blind. Okay, so one percent of all the people will go blind because of what's called wet AMD. Now it turns out that the genetics of this 
are relatively simple. Only five genes, only 13 genetic variations, 13 polymorphisms, account for most of this disease. There are environmental factors too, smoking, obesity, that are additional risk factors. Okay? But the genetic factors are very simple. So we can now, with a trivial test, predict your risk of progressing. If you have the dry form AMP, we can predict your risk and the rate, actually, at which you're likely to progress to the web. And this is useful because we have therapy. Now, the therapy that prevents progression is a monthly injection into the eye of VEGF inhibitors. It's very effective, but it's not pleasant. You don't want to treat people this way until they need it. And so the way that physicians use this genetic test is to decide how often to do more complex screening of the retina. Uh, if a patient has a very low genetic risk, then maybe they can see a retinal specialist once every few years. And if they have a very high genetic risk, they better see a retinal specialist every few months. Because once the progression to wet form starts, you can't reverse it. You can stop continuing the drug, but the drug is not reversed. Okay? So this is one example where whole genome analysis by a whole bunch of different laboratories produced results. And from a scientific viewpoint, four of those five genes are in the complement. So this is a very simple situation. And undoubtedly, we will see better therapy, though, now that we understand which pathway is going wrong. But that's the exception. And most of the other common diseases that have been analyzed by looking at germline, by looking at the inherited you know, variations, uh, have uh, yielded 20, 50 genes involved. So it's too complicated to analyze. Okay. In addition, we know that for most complex genes, that the environment plays roughly as important a role as genetics. And we know this in human because we have monozygotic twins. We have identical twins. And we also have dizygotic twins, fraternal twins. And monozygotic twins have identical germline DNA sequences. And dizygotic twins have half of them. And so by comparing phenotypes in monozygotic twins, and dizygotic twins, we can dissect the importance of genetics and the environment. And I can give you the answer from hundreds of papers. It's half and half. Almost anything you can think of, roughly, it's half and half. Okay? So, what I've tried to show you thus far is that because humans are genetically very variable, we are not rats. Okay? And because our environment is very variable, we don't live in laboratory cages. The problem of making predictions uh, is just not going to happen uh, uh, in the near future. So when you have a problem that's too complex, the effective strategy is to try to solve and the way to do that for complex disease is to divide these diseases up into subcategories. Uh, and you can try to do that by using clinical parameters. But in fact, what's working very well is to use molecular parameters. So uh, for example, you can use gene expression patterns in a whole bunch of people who have arthritis, to dissect arthritis into different subtypes, not based on the final pathology, 
but based on a sort of molecular picture of what seems to be going on. And what happens then is that each disease becomes many diseases. And there's nothing wrong with that, but you can see what you're really, you're taking a problem that's impossibly difficult to solve, and you're dividing it into 10 problems, each of which is still very hard to solve. So progress is going to be slow. Now, oops, wait a minute. This just died. That's the germline. That's the DNA sequence that you inherited from your parents. But what I'm going to focus on for the rest of this talk is what happens in somatic tissue. What happens in the blood, or I'm going to focus on the blood, but what happens in tissue in general. Okay? And it turns out that you, the DNA sequence that you inherit from your parents is mostly constant. There are exceptions. But the way that sequence is used and the way it's modified change. So the most important thing that happens is something called epigenetics. Okay? DNA methylation, which is a sophisticated, sophisticated mechanism that's used to distinguish cell types, distinguish tissues, and uh, it's one of the basic mechanisms that determines which genes are expressed and which genes are not. And we know that DNA methylation is dramatically it is dramatically affected by the environment. And how do we know that? We can start with identical twins. At birth. They have identical DNA methylation patterns. As soon as they're born, their methylation patterns start differing. The older they get, the more different their methylation patterns. Okay? So we know that at the DNA level, although the sequence usually doesn't change, the methylation pattern does. And so this is why that identical twins who have the same DNA sequence can be quite different as they get very old because they have different epigenetics. Now in addition to epigenetics at the level of DNA, RNA expression changes as identical twins get older. And in addition, I need to remind you that only 1% of your DNA is human DNA. The other 99% of your DNA is bacterial DNA or fungal DNA from all the critters that live on top of our skin and inside our body and in every body orifice. Okay? So you're born more or less sterile. But as you grow, you rapidly become a product of your microbial environment. And we understand now that uh, this is very important in distinguishing health from disease. And um, it is a very useful clinical signature of what's happening to people. Um, finally, there are very specialized cases in which the DNA of tissues is not the same as the DNA that you're born with. And the two outstanding examples of this are cancer and in the immune system. So in cancer, the genome is no longer the same as the host. Because cancer is a disease of genome instability. The genome starts to change. And there are mutants and uh, various chromosomal rearrangements which make cancer cells different from normal cells. And these changes determine 
the behavior of the cat. So they're not just metaphenomena, they're the driving force that makes cancer happen. Okay, so that's one example. The other example is in the immune system, where rearrangements at the level of DNA occur in all kinds of lymphocytes, and they determine the immunological behavior of those cells. Okay? There may be other examples, but people haven't found them yet. Okay, so what I've tried to say thus far is that instead of trying to predict genetic risk, which I think is too difficult, it makes more sense to focus on using genetics to try to find early signs of disease, to try to characterize disease progression, to look at the response to drugs, to look at recurrence in diseases like cancer. Okay? That's the general rule. But there is one exception. The one part of human genetics which turns out to be very simple is response to drugs. Because if you think about it, if I'm giving you a drug, I'm making a very tiny perturbation on your environment. So in a way, it's not surprising that if I make a small perturbation, the genetic determinants that reflect what happens with that perturbation might also be simple. And in the vast majority of cases, they are. So there's a whole field called pharmacogenetics, or now pharmacogenomics, which has grown up over the past two decades. And it turns out that by looking at just a few hundred single base changes in your sequence, I have a pretty good idea about the way you're going to respond to most drugs. Okay? So this is the exception. Um, the other possible exception is an infectious disease. So we at least know a few cases where very simple germline genetic changes dramatically affect your susceptibility to infectious disease. And the famous example, if you haven't heard it before, is a, a deletion of a loop of protein in a gene called CCR5 which is the receptor that the HIV uses to get into lymphocytes. And a small fraction of the human population is homozygous for that deletion. And they reveal that HIV, they can't get the disease. Okay. So there may be more cases like that. Drugs, infections, relatively simple, but complex diseases not. Okay, so what we're gonna talk about in the rest of this lecture is what's called biomarkers. Trying to use DNA or other molecular signatures that uh, allow us to make clinical decisions in an intelligent way. And, um, oops, wait a minute. Yes, okay. Um, there are many candidates but I want you to focus on DNA because I think it's the best. And I think it's the best for two reasons. If I can see a DNA change, it's usually causative. It's the root of the problem. And it turns out that my ability to measure in clinical samples, DNA, far exceeds any other type of molecule for two reasons. DNA is very stable, doesn't change. You can even, even get it from fossils. And I have the polymerase chain reaction. I have a universal way of amplifying any DNA sequence to any extent that I want. So I just have power that does not exist with any other kind of animal. Okay, now, nobody likes to have needles poked in them or pieces of tissue removed. Okay. So it's pretty obvious that 
the ideal situation to sample a biomarker is to try to do it non-invasively or minimally invasively. And um, so if you think of the possibilities, you can look in urine, you can look in the mouth, in feces, but blood is the best source. And, and the reason is pure practical. We already have all over the world an established infrastructure for drawing blood and doing blood-based systems. <laughs> so all I'm going to propose and demonstrate in the rest of this talk that we extend, can we do something about this? <laughs> can no, we extend? Sorry. Yeah. Uh, one other alternative, let's just try another microphone. Once again, yeah. yeah. and sorry about that. Every other cell in the blood, but it's methylation. Too. 
So for some of these situations, like cardiovascular disease and neurological disease, we're going to have to look at that way. But for other situations, like pregnancy and cancer, we can look at the DNA sequence directly. Excuse me. Yes. Can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, when you use PCR, uh, you require a small sequence to the work. Can we conserve the methylation? No. No. Uh, PCR erases the methylation pattern by any PCR method known today. So if I want to look at methylation, I have to have fancy effect. And, I'll and I have to do it before the DCR, and I will show you one of those tricks in a few minutes. But you feel very small problem. All right, it's enough. I'll show you. Okay. Oops, sorry. Okay, now. Okay, so the good news is that in every one of these disease situations, there is DNA that has information about the disease in the blood. The bad news is it not very much. Okay. And let me be a little more specific. If I take whole blood, only one part in 100,000 of the DNA comes from cell death, comes from apoptosis. All the rest of the DNA in the blood is inside the blood cells. And I don't want to see that DNA. So I have to have very, very good methods when I isolate blood to avoid breaking the cells. The reason why this field has been difficult until recently, is that all the standard methods for isolating blood broke some cells. So the DNA I wanted to see that reflected cell death was diluted with blood cell DNA that is not it. But we've now got very good methods to isolate blood and not break blood cells. These methods are so sensitive that if the person who draws the blood is sloppy with the needle and tears a bit of the vein, we see that. We see background from those endothelial cells. So this is very, very good method. But we have to live with the fact that on average, in blood, there's only, in a healthy, normal person, a thousand molecules of any sequence. And if I look at a pregnant woman or a tumor, of those thousand molecules, only 10% may come from the baby or the cancer. So now I'm down to 100 molecules. And if I only have 100 molecules, a problem arises called stochastic, which is a fundamental physics problem. When I have few molecules, I have statistical fluctuations. For if I try to measure how many molecules I have, so I can no longer make precise quantitative measurements. And if I have very few molecules, I might accidentally have no molecules. And then I just and then all together. Okay? So in this limit where I have very few molecules, I'm going to run into problems. And I'm going to need fancy solutions to those problems, as you'll see. Now what makes this problem worse is that if I compare people, the amount of small DNA fragments in their blood just for normal healthy people, differs tremendously from person to person. And we don't know why. So in pregnant women, there's a 20-fold variation in the amount of DNA in the blood 
And it has absolutely nothing to do with the gestational age of the fetus. It has nothing to do with the size of the fetus. Just don't know what it is at the moment. And in cancer, it's worse. It's about a hundredfold variation in the amount of DNA in the blood. So what I'm telling you is that some pregnant women or some cancer patients have a lot of DNA in their blood. And so the problem of stochastic noise goes away. But other patients have tiny amounts of DNA in their blood. And then the problem of stochastic noise becomes insurmountable. So what we have to do is estimate for each patient how much DNA is in the blood before we start analyzing it. And I'll show you how we do that in a few minutes. Okay. Now, there are ways to overcome stochastic noise. And there really are two approaches. If I have a noisy situation but I can perform replica experiments, then I can reduce the noise by the square root of the number of experiments that I do. So if I do 100 experiments, I can reduce the noise by a factor of 10. But my procedure of looking at DNA in blood require that I start with at least a few cc's of blood. And I normally start with, with 10 cc's of blood. So I can't do that a hundred times and bleed the patient to death, essentially, okay? So that just doesn't work. I can't repeat it. The alternative, which is less obvious, but it's what we actually use in prenatal diagnosis, is to find different DNA sequences which give the same answer. And if I can find many different DNA sequences which have the equivalent information set, I can average, not from multiple samples, but I can average within one sample. And once again, I can approve my signal to noise by the square root of the multiple And you'll see that we do that. Okay, so this is just summarizing um, non-invasive prenatal diagnosis, and I'll come back to it. This summarizes the current situation, and I'll come back to that. And uh, uh, I want to just make a comment about what experimental methods I'm going to be using. I'm not going to show you these methods really at all. But I just want you to know how this is done. If we have a problem which can be solved by a single genetic locus, a single marker, a single base, we use the polymerase chain reaction. It's sensitive, it's adequate, it's key, it's hard. If I have a problem that needs to be addressed by 10 markers or 100 markers, we tend to use DNA mass spectrometry, which is basically just a fancy way of doing the PCR and detecting lots of things at once. And if we have a problem that requires thousands or more markers, then we do high throughput DNA sequences. Those are the three methods. And what you will see in the rest of the talk that for prenatal diagnosis, we're doing sequencing and a little bit of mesotropology. And for cancer, we're doing mesotropology. But what I want you to focus on in this lecture is not the methods, but the answer. Okay. So non-invasive prenatal testing. We take 10 cc's of peripheral blood from the mother's arm. And uh, as you'll see, we're going to sequence it. At, uh, we're going to basically do about 15 million sequence reads of short DNA fragments. So we generate a tremendous amount of data. It's not a whole genome work. The way I like to think about it, it's the quick pencil sketch that somebody would do before they meet an automate. 
So it describes the genome, but in a very rough way. You have to do about 100 times the genome sequencing to actually have the auto to, to have the whole uh, detail. All right. Now, in an average pregnancy, these are real numbers. Now. In an average pregnancy, 13% uh, of the DNA in the mother's blood is from the mother, and 87% is uh, I'm sorry, 13% of the DNA in an average pregnancy is from the fetus, 87% is from the mother. But as I've already mentioned, the range is anywhere from just a few percent to almost anywhere. Now imagine a situation where the mother has too little fetal DNA to protect. If we measure the DNA in that mother, we're going to conclude that the fetus is healthy. It's the mother's healthy. We won't find any sequence after that. And we're going to conclude that the fetus is female. That's the mother's female. Okay. And this is a false name. And we'd like to try to minimize that. Okay. So we have to have a way of looking at a pregnant woman and before we spend a lot of money sequencing, ask, okay, how much fetal DNA does she have? If the fetus is male, this is trivial. Because the mother's female, she doesn't have a Y chromosome. So if we look at sequences from the Y chromosome, they uniquely must come from the fetus. And so for male fetuses, we quantify using the Y chromosome. But half of all fetuses are female. They have no um, And to make things worse, if you're interested, as we are, in looking at what are called anatomies, fetuses that don't have the right number of chromosomes, in most cases, the extra chromosome that's going to cause problems comes from the mother. And so there are no sequence differences that can be looked at. Right? Okay, so remember I mentioned epigenetics. The mother and the female fetus have very similar DNA sequence, but they have very different Methylation, they have very different epigenetics. Oops, I'm sorry. Okay. So, what we've done is to search the genome for sequences that have the following properties. In all fetuses, they're methylated. In all mothers, they're not. And furthermore, they fall into the recognition sites of enzymes that can cut those sequences only when there's no method. So as this picture shows, what we can do, starting with a mixture of maternal DNA and fetal DNA, is we can destroy all the maternal DNA. And now we're left only with the fetal DNA. And so we can detect and quantify the fetal DNA. And we do that on every patient before deciding to sequence. And in practice, if there's more than 4% fetal DNA, we, uh, we go on and sequence. And if there's less, we disqualify the sample. And we have to disqualify about 1% of the sample. Now, I'll show you what one of these methylation sites looks like. Uh, just uh, so it let's close. So this is one place in the genome. And um, what I'm plotting is the number of methylated molecules in a, in a sample of mother's blood. And if the mother's not pregnant, there are no methylated molecules. Even earlier than eight weeks of gestation, I can see methylated molecules in a pregnant woman. And 
uh, after they eat, there's a nice healthy signal. And you can see that it varies a lot from mother to mother. And here's the number of molecules. It's about 100 molecules. So when I mentioned before that I'm dealing with 100 molecules, this is how I know. All right? So this mother, most of these mothers can be analyzed. Okay. Right. Now, we want to look, using the mother's blood, for properties of the fetus, uh, so that the mother can be either reassured that the fetus is likely to be healthy when born, or to show that there's a problem and then the mother has to deal with that problem. The most common problems in developing fetuses are trisomes uh, and extra copy of one another. The most famous of these by far is trisomy 21. That's Down syndrome. The other common trisomies are trisomy 13, trisomy 18. They're rare, but they do occur. As far as we know, all the other trisomies are fatal. They occur, but the fetus dies. As far as we know, all the monosomes, they say the whole chromosome. Our the fetus okay. So from a practical viewpoint, if we're looking for defects that involve loss or gain of a whole chromosome, the only ones we actually have to look at are 21, 13, and 18. Oops, sorry. Here's a cartoon. Uh, and I've colored red the fragments of DNA that come from the fetus and blue the fragments of DNA that come from the mother. But there are no useful sequence differences here, not at the level of resolution that I've described. So if I sequence this mixture, I don't know the pink fragments, the red fragments from the blue fragments. They all look the same. So what I do is choose random fragments of DNA from the mother's blood. And I sequence 36 bases. And when I compare that sequence to the genome, then if it matches exactly somewhere in the genome, I know which chromosome that fragment came from. So by performing this measurement, over and over again, I can eventually make a histogram like this plot, which is the number of fragments that came from each chromosome. And as you can see again in color, some of the fragments came from the fetus, the rest came from the mother, but I really don't know which. If the fetus has an extra copy of, let's say, chromosome 21. Then fragments from that chromosome will be overrepresented in the mother's blood. I wish I could tell you it's a big effect, but it's not a big effect. It's a very small effect. So I have to measure this excess abundance uh, very precisely. But I can do that by DNA sequence because I just make so many reads that I've sampled hundreds of different sequences, thousands of different sequences on each one. So I get around the stochastic moment and I can achieve amazing experimental precision by just getting lots and lots of data. Okay, so this shows you results of a clinical trial that looked at 1,800, 1,800 pregnant women. And what I'm plotting vertically is a statistical measure of whether or not for each mother there is an overrepresentation 
of that chromosome. It's something called the z score. If you're familiar with the statistics. And what I'm plotting horizontally for each mother is the fraction of these here. And you can see that those mothers who have a high percentage of fetal DNA tend to have a very significant statistical overrepresentation uh, if they're carrying uh, a trisomy fetus. And those mothers who have uh, very little fetal DNA, things get in the These results demonstrate that I have pretty good ability to distinguish between the mothers where there's an abnormal amount of chromosome 18 or 13 or 21 from all the normal. So this was a clinical trial. This was published two years ago. And um, what this basically shows, oops, I'm sorry. This basically shows that uh, we make almost no errors. One of the few errors. Almost perfect. Yes. But this was two years ago. We now have improved analytical methods. We have improved experimental methods. And the accuracy of these tests is not perfect. But it's astounding. We make only a few errors per thousand patients. And this actually shows data for uh, chromosome 21 uh, on, I think, about 120,000 women. And this was all done in a commercial diagnostic setting. And uh, you can see that with the rarest of exceptions, there's a pretty good distinction between the mothers where things are overrepresented and the mothers in, where things are fall within the normal sort of gassing. Now, where we make a mistake, we can almost always explain. If we have a false negative, if the fetus really does have an extra copy of the chromosome, but we don't see it, it's almost always in the mother who has relatively little fetal DNA. So we, we have the option of eliminating the false negatives by demanding a higher minimum percent fetal DNA. If we went to 8% fetal DNA instead of 4% fetal DNA as our threshold for analysis, we could probably eliminate all the false negatives. But then we might have 5% of the sample that cannot be analyzed. Okay. So we've chosen to accept a very small false negative uh, rate. And if you're familiar with the invasive tests, like amniocentesis or chorionic villus samplings, these non-invasive tests now are actually better. That's the amazing. These are actually more reliable. But even more interesting than the false negatives is the false positive. So we see uh, you know, a few cases per thousand of uh, what we call a trisomy. So we tell the physician who tells the mother, your fetus has got Down syndrome or one of the others. And the mother decides, I'm going to have the baby anyway. And the baby turns out to be normal. We know why. And it's biology. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. There's a phenomenon called confined placental mosaic. The placenta is trisomal, but the fetus is normal. Most of the free DNA in the mother's blood comes from the placenta. So when this rare event occurs, we will always be wrong. The other one, which happens quite a bit, is called a lost twin, or a vanishing twin. Okay. So the pregnancy starts out as a twin pregnancy. 
One fetus is trisomic. The other fetus is normal. Trisomic fetuses are not very viable. The trisomic fetus dies. But the placenta that it laid down is still trisomic. And so we see the extra chromosome from a fetus that's no longer there. Okay? And we've got uh, thousands of twin samples that have already been analyzed. So this is, this is unfortunately happens. And then there are other things occasionally. Right? But there's another interesting possibility which happens, which I think the first time we saw this, it really shocked everybody. Okay, this patient. Z means excess if it's positive, deficit if it's negative. Uh, this patient looks like uh, they have trisomy 21, but they have uh, monosomy 13, monosomy 18. The fetus can't be alive. But it is alive. This mother has cancer. What we're actually seeing is free DNA coming not just from the fetus, but also from the tumor. And in this case, the tumor is deficient in chromosome 13 and 18 and has an excess of chromosome 21. That's fine as far as the tumor is concerned. Okay? This is not an isolated event. Here's, oh, I'm so sorry. This is Okay. Here's another case. We saw something similar. It looked like trisomy 18, but monosomy 21, monosomy 13. People in the lab repeated the experiment. You can see how good these measurements are. We got the same thing. Again, this mother has cancer. Okay. So, jumping ahead for a minute, this already shows you that the methods I'm using for prenatal diagnosis can also be used for cancer diagnosis. But before I go there, I want to give you a glimpse into the future with prenatal diagnosis. So what's commercially available today are the major antibodies. 21, 13, 18, and fetuses that have abnormal numbers of X and Y chromosomes. So there are a lot of sex chromosome antibodies. But that's not all we see. This is a real patient. What I'm plotting is the uh, average abundance of DNA fragments that are signed along the genome. Here, starting from chromosome 7 and proceeding all the way to the X and Y chromosome. And if you look at this plot, you can see that at the beginning of chromosome 18, there are too many counts. So this patient has an excess of DNA fragments from the short arm of chromosome 18. And when we see something like this, we don't know if it's the mother or the fetus or both. We just know there's too much of part of chromosome 18. And we can tell the difference between the mother and the fetus. Because when we make plasma, we keep the mother's blood cell. So we can go back to the mother's blood cells, the so-called buffy coat, and analyze the mother and tell. Okay. This happens a lot. Okay, here's just a few more. Real clinical examples, you can see that uh, this is chromosome 1. You can see that at one end and at the other end, uh, there aren't enough counts. Chromosome 2, uh, there are too many counts here. <laughs> chromosome 3, you can see there's a region where there's not enough counts and so on. Okay. These are called microdeletions or microduplications. Every one of you has this in your name. Obviously, it hasn't hurt you too bad. And some of them are very bad. <laughs> some of them, most of them are not. Okay? So some of these have names, pretty shot, many others. Okay? And what you'll see uh, over the coming year or two is that 
instead of just telling mothers and physicians about anecdotes, we're going to tell them about these smaller genomic changes, which are clinically understood. And the more we sequence, or the better statistics we develop, the more we see. In fact, so almost three years ago, Dennis Lowe and I published the complete genome sequence of an unborn fetus assembled by sequencing factors from the mother's blood. Now this was a tremendous amount of sequence because we're not sequencing one genome, we're sequencing the mother and the fetus together and we have to have enough sequence information to tease them apart. So this is not something that can be done easily at the present time. And it can be done. At the moment, it's outrageously expensive to do this. But sequencing costs keep dropping. And in a few years, it'll probably be possible to do this if people want to know the genome sequence of their fetus before it's born. Before we start to do this, people have to think very carefully about how they're going to use that information. Because really, in many respects, you know, you're learning too much at this point. And, and uh, I, I think it would be a mistake uh, to start choosing your fetuses based on frivolous concerns like hair color or eye color or whatever. But, but the information can be measured. So that's prenatal. And that's the long story. And in the time that remains, I'm going to show you the beginnings of the same kind of progress looking at things. Now, I already told you, in both pregnancy and cancer, there's DNA from the foreign body, from the fetus or from the tumor, present in the blood of the host. Um, this summarizes uh, the average amount of that DNA in uh, pregnant women, in healthy volunteers, and in late stage cancer patients. And I don't think the difference between pregnant women and healthy volunteers that you see on this slide. I don't think that difference is meaningful because different methods were used. But I think the difference between healthy volunteers and late stage cancer is very significant because it's the same. So patients who have cancer tend to have a lot more DNA in their blood. And it's very tempting to try to conclude that most of that extra DNA is from the cancer. Now, honestly, we don't actually know that today. I think it's very likely. But we just know that there's a lot more DNA in the blood. So here what I'm showing you for a bunch of different late stage cancers is the amount of DNA in the blood, just total DNA in the blood. Uh, colorectal cancer, breast cancer, melanoma, etc. healthy volunteers. Okay. And you can see two things. Tremendous variation from patient to patient. The same problem we have with pregnant women. So everybody's a And the other thing that you can see is that some of these patients, once again, have a lot of DNA in their uh, Blood. So we're not going to have to worry too much about stochastic noise. But some of them have relatively little DNA in their blood. And so our ability to analyze this is uh, much worse. Okay. So when you see data like this, the obvious question is 
if I look in the book to determine the properties of the cancers, do I get the same answer as if I do an invasive biopsy of the cancer? So cancers are characterized by sequence differences relative to a normal host. And so do I see or do I not see the same sequence differences in the blood of the cancer patient and in the cancer. And the answer don't look at the slide, it's too complicated. The answer is 50-50. Half of what I see in the tumor is the same as what I see in the blood. And half of what I see in the blood is the same. And there were two reasons for this. First, stochastic noise. I'm in the domain with many of these patients where I don't have enough molecules to be reliable. And furthermore, my experimental methods are not, in what I've shown you thus far, as sensitive as they need to be. So in this study, which was published last year, they're using methods which are tenfold less sensitive than the methods now are. So some of this discrepancy is probably just experimental, but some of it is real. The second problem is more fundamental, and it's really the interesting one. If I look at a tumor and isolate DNA from the tumor, by and large, I'm looking at tumor cells that are alive. And if I look in the blood, I'm looking at DNA from tumor cells that have died. And this doesn't have to be the same. Okay? So there's no reason why I should have perfect but nevertheless, already, you see that I can draw some inferences. I can non-invasively, not perfectly, but I can non-invasively begin to describe properties of the cancer without touching it by looking in the blood. And I, I show you in a few minutes useful properties. But it turns out that in addition to these sequence differences, these <coughs> mutations that define the properties of the tumor, uh, the very amount of DNA in the blood is unexpectedly clinically useful. So this shows the survival time of patients over roughly a two-year period as a function of how much DNA they have in their blood. Patients with very little DNA in their blood have very good survival. Patients with a lot of DNA in their blood have terrible survival. So we've got two kinds of information now. How much is there? And then which sequence is there? Okay. Alright, so I'm going to show you one example. It's just published. It's small, non-small cell lung cancer. And many patients with non-small cell lung cancer have mutations in a gene called EGFR. And that defines the properties of these cancers. The patients with this mutation, which by the way is not linked to small control, uh, uh, have improper cell signaling and they have cancer. And those patients can be treated very effectively with several new types of kinase inhibitors. That's the good news. So if you have one of these activating mutations, if you have to have lung cancer, you're better off having lung cancer with one of these active, activating mutations because we can treat you. But unfortunately, some of the patients who have the activating mutation get a secondary mutation which is, uh, no, don't, sorry, don't change it, which is called T790M. It's a single amino acid chain. And in these patients, the drugs are not very effective. They're still better than nothing, 
but they're not very effective. Okay? So what was done in this paper was to look at the blood of patients with lung cancer being treated with tyrosine kinase inhibitors using now very sensitive methods, contemporary methods, methods 10 times more sensitive than were available last year, and asked whether they could see these mutations in the blood, and if so, asked whether the response of the patients who had the mutation was, as one would predict, worse than the patients who did. And that's shown, Alex, on the next slide. Okay, so just look at the left-hand side. The green patients don't have this T790M mutation in their blood. And you can see that they survived, uh, at least progressed this progression pre-survival, so the tumor is not getting worse. They survived for almost three years. Um, but the red patients have this mutation that compromises the drug. Uh, and you can see their, their performance in the clinic is much worse. One example. I'm telling you that although the results are not published yet, there are probably now 10 examples. So this is turning out to be absolutely moral medical practice. It's still experimental. So you know, the research protocol. But you monitor the patient while they're getting therapy, and you see mutations come or go that affect the efficacy of the therapy. And in some cases, when you see these mutations, if you have an alternative therapy, you would switch the alternative. And all this is being done uh, non-invasively. Okay, now. Let's go back and, and let me show you just one, uh, one last thing. Um, I need high sensitivity if I want to see just a small amount of cancer in a patient. If I have a late stage cancer patient that has a huge amount of DNA in their blood, and most of it, let's say, comes from the cancer, it's an easy matter. But once I treat that patient, the amount of cancer DNA in the blood plummets to almost nothing. And then my ability to monitor what's happening becomes highly common. So what I really need is methods that will, even if there's just one or two molecules of cancer-specific DNA, in the patient's blood that I can still find. Them. And what I want to show you is that we have these methods. This is a bit technical, but and I'm going to need the laser pointer back. Uh, if I can get this to the Okay. Alright. So here's a situation. Let's suppose I have one percent, one percent of my DNA fragments in the blood are mutant. And 99% are wild uh, type. There's so much, uh, so much wild type that it's very hard to see the mutants. And so I need the trick. And the trick is shown on the right hand side. It's um, well. Can we go forward one, Alex? Go forward one slide. Uh, I'll show you, you have the flipper. Okay, all right, okay. Um, then I click correctly. Okay. You just um, have to be slow. So here's my wild type. Yeah. I don't want to see it. Here's my new yeah. I want to see it. Mm -hmm. The way I'm seeing it is by performing a single base sequencing three. Taking a sequencing primer any one base to it in an enzymatic reaction and generating a product which I can then analyze. And what I do is I leave out the base cube, which would normally extend this primer on a C template. But I still keep the base cube 
which will extend. So what happens is I can't generate any product from my wild type template, but I can still generate products from my mutant template. And then when I look by an analytical method, in this case, it's best spectrometry. When I look at the product, you can see I only see a mutant signal. There's no wild type signal. And this turns out to be incredibly sensitive. These are just uh, experiments with synthetic mixtures. Uh, and if I put in 1% mutant sequences, you can see I get very strong peaks. Half a percent, very strong peaks. Quarter percent, very strong peaks. But there's no background. Okay? So I'm showing you here detection of, of one part in uh, a few hundred. And by perfecting this, we have detection sensitivity of close to one part per thousand. And if you pay attention to what I've been saying in the talk, you realize that I can't do better than one in a thousand. Because I only have a thousand molecules on average, okay? So if there's one molecule that's see you that's cancer specific with a sensitivity of a part per thousand, I could see it. And if I had a higher sensitivity, it wouldn't do me any good because there wouldn't be any molecules to see. Okay. So using these new tricks, I think over the next couple of years, what you're going to see is a great progress in non-invasive monitoring of cancer. And the way this is going to work, I think most people agree, is the following. If somebody actually has cancer, we do a biopsy once. You get a sample of the cancer. We look for mutations. If there are mutations that make that cancer sensitive to drugs, you treat with those drugs. You monitor the treatment by looking at DNA in the blood, which is a harmless procedure. And if the treatment is efficacious, you keep it up. And if it's if the sequences are changing or if they're becoming more abundant, you choose other therapy. So this is likely to change very substantially the way patients are managed. And this is truly personalized medicine. And people use the term personalized medicine very loosely. But this is really personalized medicine because each person's tumor will be used to design the optimal analytical strategy and the optimal therapeutic strategy for that patient. Okay, so I'm going to stop at this point. Uh, I think it's been long enough. And I'd be delighted if you have questions. If disappointed if you don't have any. Thank you. My name is uh, Nadezhda. Thank you for the wonderful lecture. And uh, could you tell at what, uh, at what stage of cancer detectable amounts of uh, tumor DNA appear in the blood? Okay, so the question, is to say it louder, is at what stage in the cancer uh, do detectable amounts of DNA At what stage of cancer detectable amounts yeah. of yeah, appear in the blood? Yeah. We don't know. <laughs> so we don't know. Yeah. We, it's a great question, and it's something that needs to be tested by experimental research. And it's a very hard problem. Okay. Here's why. The right way to do that experiment is to take someone who doesn't have cancer and look at the DNA in their blood and then watch things change when they get cancer. But that requires that I really know in advance who is going to get cancer. And I don't know that. So I need what you're asking uh, can be addressed by experiments. But those experiments turn out to be very costly because I have to start with lots of people and monitor them 
and then see which ones get cancer, what kind of cancer. And then I can go back and look at the blood I collected before they got the cancer. Okay. Otherwise, what I'm afraid is that there are such large variations from one person to another that if I try to do a more traditional cross-sectional study, uh, it's going to be very messy. But there's probably some correlation between the tumor burden and the amount of DNA in the blood. But remember, in pregnancy, there's no correlation between the fetal size and the amount of DNA in the blood. So if I can draw an analogy, in addition to the size of the tumor, there probably are other variables that may even be more important. And today, I don't know what they are. So believe me, in three years from now, I'll have a better answer. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Charles. Next question. Igor. Uh, I'm Igor. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, to um, continue with the previous question, uh, can we uh, somehow uh, improve our understanding uh, with experiments on animals? We can uh, insert uh, human uh, humans into laboratory animals and uh, look. Uh, uh, what uh, amounts of uh, DNA uh, we can see there? Yeah, so um, the, yeah, uh, 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 so first of all, what, what the, just to give a name to what you just said, there's a, a trick called xenograms, in which you, you take a bit of a human tumor and you implant it in an immune compromised mouse. And then you can watch the tumor grow, and you can try to treat the tumor. And it's, it is a human tumor. And you can do this with a real patient. And so you can actually do experiments to help guide patient therapy by using xenographs. Okay. The thing we actually know is that the xenograph tumor that develops has the same mutations that the patient has. That we know, and that, that's been experimentally done very nicely. I'm worried with a mouse that I simply can't get enough plasma volume mm -hmm. to do the analysis if things scale the way they do with the human. Now, I don't know that anybody's done the experiment, and so you know, one thing to speculate, it's much more important to do the experiment. But I'm willing to guess it's just going to be tough. Okay? Too bad. I mean, I think, yeah. But, but if, 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 if you could see it, it would be, of course, it would be great. Um, so we have to do this different way. <laughs> okay. Uh, my name is uh, Sergei. I am from Ivy League. I'm And uh, I have a question. Uh, if you try to use uh, from cervix instead of blood to de de determine the short fragments of the fetal brain. Say it again, instead of blood using uh, liquids from cervix. From the cervix? Cervix. Yeah, okay. That, so I, I, the answer is yes. We, we have done some of that. Um, it, um, it looks interesting, but there's a problem. So if you're going to look at liquid from the cervix, uh, you have to be guaranteed that the woman has not had sexual intercourse for a few days, prior, at least a few days prior uh, to uh, taking the sample. Otherwise, it's complete In some periods of pregnancy, intercourse is forbidden. Well, but those are often too late to do much clinical intervention, right? Okay. So, but, but it, it is an approach. That, it's an approach that looks very promising, as a matter of fact. Yeah. It's just um, the uh, the sampling is, you know, more complex than just taking blood. 
But there's, there is plenty of field DNA there. What about the concentration of DNA? Oh, it's good. It's higher than it is in what? It is, yeah. But why do you not use that? <laughs> um, the blood works really well. And, and is, um, all pregnant women have blood work. So the sample chain is, doesn't require any difference in practice. The cervical sampling um, is um, tricky because you have to, I, 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 there's a lot that I can't talk about. You have to do it, it's almost an invasive procedure. You have to do it very carefully. It's almost invasive. Okay? And so it requires special tools, and it's not, you know, it's not established medical practice. It's something that we're extremely interested in. And uh, because um, if I could get more DNA, then at least for those women who have relatively small amounts of DNA in the blood, this would be the alternative I could, I could still analyze. It's for the future. You can use for differential comparison with the blood. Of course. Yeah. And uh, what other liquids do you try? What are the liquids? What other uh, biological liquids do you try? Okay, so yeah. people have published results on urine. You. Yeah. Uh, I think some of the original data was very poor. Uh, but I would not rule out uh, looking at urine in the future. I, I think it, 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 it's possible. The, the problem in urine is that the DNA fragments are much smaller than the DNA fragments in blood. And so you need very special DNA handling methods uh, to deal with those very small fragments. But um, people are making progress doing this in cancer. And so it may be worth, especially things like bladder cancer, kidney cancer and so on, and urine is an obviously good source. So maybe uh, worth going back and looking at this again. But again, you know, blood is, if you're going to talk about doing research tests, all of this is wonderful. But if you're going to be, if you're doing hundreds of thousands of tests a year, <laughs> and you're not connected to existing clinical protocols, it's very costly because you have to set up a whole system of care. So that's why I think the blood is probably here to stay. Even if the other methods eventually work well, I think the blood is probably here to stay. We are confused with trying to introduce the genetics in our world. But uh, the problem is that we don't care to educate uh, geneticists, physicians. These are the main problem of information in this. Yeah. Can you advise us how we can solve the problem? Right. So, um, I, I think <coughs> the long term solution is to make genetics a really formal and important part of medical education. So that doctors become at least decent genetics. And now that we know how important genetics is, and we have all these powerful tools. And I used to chair a medical school genetics program. <laughs> okay, so I can tell you that doctors get a very poor education in genetics, but this has to change. Um, the short-term solution, uh, in the U.S. and in Japan, uh, is to use genetic counseling and to uh, more or less couple a genetic consultation to uh, the diagnostic procedure. So, for example, in Japan, where testing started just in April, what the government decided is that prior to the test, they require a consult with a genetic counselor, and then of course afterwards. Okay. So that the woman before she was tested understands the genetics of what's being done, and then when the result comes in, it's interpreted not by the physician, 
but by the genetic cascade. So uh, if you have enough genetic cascade in Russia, then that would be a good solution. Um, at at sequent, we provide some counseling assistance to those physicians that don't have the knowledge or access to genetic counseling. But in the US, most large obstetric practices now at least have one genetic counselor. Yeah, but I mean, this, this is a real problem. There's no question. The public doesn't understand genetics, and most doctors don't understand genetics. Well, uh, does the genome uh, make you make this go right away? How does, how does the genome occur? Oh, wait, so we actually have a, a whole uh, sort of staff of, I forget what we call them, medical experts that you know, basically talk to the physicians. So again, this is, becomes quite detailed in terms of US medical practice, which uh, could very well be different from things here in Russia. But with the type of tests we're doing, we are not allowed to interact with the patient. We're only allowed to interact with the physician. So we have to do everything through the physician's office. And here, it might be different. You are afraid of responsibility. No, no, because because this is not FDA approved, and so we're not allowed to deal with technology like that. It's a legal problem. Yeah. Yeah. My question is: uh, uh, in your opinion, will we can uh, uh, by the cloud uh, feature of the DNA in the plasma uh, define the type of cancer? Because there are some types of cancer that we can't uh, detect on the other stages uh, uh, by usual methods. Right. So, I mean, that, that's a great question, and I, I, I'm going to answer it in a funny way. Um, if I have a cancer patient, the most important thing I want to know is what drug to use, what therapy to use whether any drug is likely to work or whether I have no choice but surgery. Okay. Um, the way those decisions are made now are largely based on a biopsy and cytopathology. Okay, so that a pathologist knows it came from the stomach, looks under the microscope and sees certain kinds of cells. Okay. And honestly, that's a very poor way to characterize the now, if I look in the blood, especially at an early stage, I might not even know what tissue has the cancer. But if I see EGFR mutation, I treat the tyrus and kinase inhibitors. It doesn't matter what I call the cancer. Okay? And, and so I think what, what I'm trying to say is that as I look to the future, I think increasingly cancer will be defined by the DNA sequence defect and not by the tissue of water general and the way the cells look. Because it really is not as important, unless you're doing surgery, um, not as important to know where it is or what they look like as it is to know what I can kill them for. So that's what I think will actually happen. But honestly, of course, you're right that. I have to, at least in the short term, find a way to make congruent what the surgeon and the oncologist and the pathologist are used to dealing with and what the geneticist is dealing with. Okay? And that, that's not an easy gap to close, but that's where we are. You must have heard my talk <laughs> yesterday, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, but, but you know, you talk about cancer. Yeah. So, in addition to everything I've told you, there is information that comes from the lengths of the fragments. The fragments from 
the fetus or the fragments from the cancer are short by about 20 days later than the fragments from white blood cells and the fragments from endothelial cells in the blood cells. We don't know why it's short, but the effect's very big. It's very easily measured by the trick called paired NC, DNA sequencing. It gives you not just the signal, but gives you the length of that to a resolution of one of So this is very useful information. And um, we don't understand today why this is the the fragment lengths are such that they both appear to have come from apoptosis. But there seems to be something different about either apoptosis or post-apoptotic processing of the DNA from coincidentally at the moment cancer and fetus versus the host. Now, the 20 nucleotide difference is suspicious. It's two turns of DNA here. Right? Okay? And it's the length of the binding site for histone H1. So the simple hypothesis, which believe it or not, nobody has actually proven or disproven, is that for some reason, from cancer and from the fetus, histone H1 falls off during apoptosis. And so the nucleases can trim from 160 down to 140. But in endothelial cells and in white blood cells, H1 stays on. And so these things are 160 instead of 140. It's very, very curious. And, and um, but, but just to explain to you why this is not so simple. With DNA, PCR, and sequencing, I can work with one molecule. If I have it in the tube, I can work with it. To ask whether a histone is there or not, I need a huge sample. <laughs> I mean, my DNA methods are probably 10,000 times more sensitive than any protein method. So things that are just any student can do with DNA become problems that are impossibly difficult for any person. Okay? So we need to have find very indirect ways of doing this, and that takes time. But I, we do think that uh, uh, this difference is very significant, and it's telling us something biologically important. We just have to discover what that is. Can we use uh, the method for early diagnostics for cancer? Can we use it for early diagnostics of cancer? So I hope the answer is yes. And the issue is how do I design the clinical trial? It really comes back to the question that, that, that was asked uh, uh, over there. I, I need to do a prospective drug because the patient-to-patient -patient variation is so large. I'm afraid to do a cross-sectional study. I really need to do a prospective study. So I need to have a relatively high-risk cohort of patients who don't have cancer to bear, who will progress to cancer in the next few years. And then I start taking samples of blood. And then when they progress, for those who progress to cancer, I go back and try to see how really I do. It's a wonderful experiment. Somebody will pay for it eventually, but it's a very expensive drug. People don't like to do prospective drugs like this because they cost so much money. Because you see, it's very hard to find that enriched population. If I have breast cancer, lifetime risk is what, one in 12, okay? So over a two year period or a four year period, it's one in 100, okay? So to have a statistically significant 100 women 
for rest of breast cancer. I have to have 10,000 women. Yeah. So I'm paying for enormous clinical trial. And 99% of all the patients are useless, but I don't know which one. Right? So if you can help me figure out a way to generate an enriched population, then those trials become wonderful science and wonderful medicine. Otherwise, they just become food for very expensive. But somebody will do them because it's the only right way to do this. The alternative will be to try to figure out what causes the interpatient variability and then maybe control them. And people have been working on that for 10 years. And there's been absolutely no problem. There are many other required markets for uh, cancer, some proteins. Right. And which one is more sensitive? Okay. So I, I actually, uh, those of you who heard my lecture um, yesterday, I showed a few slides. But I'll just summarize it. The plasma DNA is probably 100 times more sensitive than CTCs or protein markers. It's no comparison. It's the best method. Much, much more sensitive. Not that there are more molecules, but because our experimental methods are so much better. And about the clinical trial, for example, uh, we know that sometimes, uh, uh, sometimes of uh, breast cancer um, are, uh, have a uh, uh, huge heritage compound. Uh, and, uh, Right. In uh, the USA, of course, uh, the mastectomy is uh, rather popular, yeah. but in Russia, is it uh, uh, very popular? Yeah. So maybe in Russia, uh, uh, we can use uh, you know, find uh, the popcorn uh, for the study. Uh, yeah. So I, I, it's funny that you mentioned that because I, I, I was actually thinking uh, as I answered this question. And if, if I could take a BRCA positive uh, population uh, that wasn't going to really just what you're saying, if I take a BRCA positive mutation that wasn't going to undergo voluntary mastectomy, uh, they would have a high risk of regression. But it's not that high a risk of regression. That's the problem. It's still pretty damn slow. But it's better. Yeah, it's much better. About 80% of that, so yeah. if you look for about five years, yeah. it's rather bad, I think. Yeah. So, I mean, I think, I think you know, that's one possibility. The other possibility would be uh, people who have been exposed to asbestos. So, if you're exposed to asbestos, you have, you have a tremendously high risk of lung cancer. So, that's yeah. Yeah. But some enriched population, one way or the other, environmentally or genetically enriched, would help this a lot. But, you know, the criticism is that if you take the BRCA patients or the asbestos exposed people, and you do a trial like that, somebody can say, ah, it's just for that population, it's not general cancer. <laughs> there are trade offs here. Um, I hope at some point we can find somebody to support a very expensive longitudinal study and do this right. Okay, I think. Is there a correlation between other diseases and the high DNA fermentation rate? Um, it's not really known. Um, there are only two other cases that I know that have actually been experimental studied right now, and that's um, um, let's see what I can think of where they are. Yeah. So people who've had bone marrow transplants, or people who've had other uh, organ transplants, uh, you can then use the sequence differences between the donor and the recipient to distinguish between DNA fragments that come from the donor and the recipient. Okay. And so there is data on transplant projections. And there's data on how a patient progresses after a bone marrow transplant. Those are the only two other cases that I know right now. And I, I, honestly, uh, I certainly am sure that in transplant rejection, 
the amount of uh, DNA in the blood goes up tremendously. But of course, that's massive cell death. Oh, and the other example, because that is disease, is trauma. Um, yeah, of course, a trauma has lots of DNA. So here we would like to conclude our uh, online discussion and we can probably take the discussion offline. So please, uh, I, those of you who uh, attended our uh, online translation can uh, send their um, questions, well, can post their questions online and we'll uh, relay them to Dr. Cantor. Uh, thank you very much and uh, have a good day.